Aliens for Dinner by Stephanie Spinner. One. Richard, have another egg roll. No thanks, Mom, I'm full, said Richard Bickerstaff glumly. How about another fried dumpling, asked Bob Baxter. They're really good, really good. He smiled encouragingly. Richard didn't smile back. I already said I'm full, he answered. This wasn't really true. He loved Chinese food, especially fried dumplings. But he liked to eat them with his mom, not with Bob Baxter, his mother's new boyfriend. Richard wished Bob would go away. He was just a big boring guy with a moving van company. What did she see in him anyway? For dates, and now he was showing up for dinner. Richard didn't get it. In most other ways, his mom was pretty smart. Well, I guess we'll have dessert then, said Mrs. Bickerstaff. You're not too full for that, are you? No, mom, said Richard, brightening a little. As far as he was concerned, the whole point of eating dinner was dessert. What are we having? Ice cream, said Mrs. Bickerstaff. She and Bob started clearing the table. And fortune cookies, of course. She pointed to the last white container on the table. As she and Bob carried plates and chopsticks into the kitchen, Richard reached for the container. Funny. There was only one cookie inside a big one. Should he open it or save it for his mom? But the fortune cookie seemed to have a mind of its own. As Richard watched, it began to rock back and forth on the table, first slowly, then faster and faster. Suddenly it burst into a dozen pieces. A tiny figure wrapped in a white paper strip struggled to stand up. Eric! Richard's heart leaped. Wow. It's great to see you. It is good to see you also. Eric's voice was gruff, but his face was friendly. As usual, though, it has not been easy getting here, he said, waving his tiny arms in the air. I have heard of economy class, but this is ridiculous. Then he unwound the paper strip and read the message on it. Keep a clear head and you will save the day. Ha, he snorted. Try keeping a clear head when you have just traveled 6.7 million miles in a fortune cookie. Richard smiled. Eric was a commander in the Interspace Brigade. His mission was to wipe out crime in the galaxy. He had appeared twice before, once in a cereal box and once in a bag of microwave popcorn to protect Earth from alien threats. Richard had helped him out both times, and both times Eric had complained a lot. Richard was used to it. He even kind of liked it. So, Eric, he said, how come you're here? Are you on a mission? Is there another threat to Earth? Richard's palms started sweating a little. He was one third afraid and two thirds excited. He knew Eric only came to Earth when there was trouble. A serious look came over the tiny alien's face. But just as he was about to answer, Richard's mother called, Richard. Which would you like, chocolate joy ride or peanut butter fantasy? Whoops! Richard whispered to Eric. We'd better go up to my room. He put the alien in his shirt pocket and headed for the stairs. Ah, uh, I'm not hungry after all, Mom, he called into the kitchen. I think I'll go up and do my homework. The minute Richard said this, Mrs. Bickerstaff appeared in the doorway. She looked worried. No ice cream, she asked. Are you feeling all right, sweetie? She put her palm against Richard's forehead. I'm fine, Mom said Richard. Really? I just forgot I have a lot of math to do. Well, all right.
right, she said uncertainly. We'll be up later to say good night. Won't we, Bob? We sure will, said Bob. We sure. Before he'd finished, Richard was up the stairs and in his room. Two. Earth is once again in danger, said Eric the minute the door was closed. A powerful group from the planet Dwild has made it their target. They are businessmen ruthless and greedy. They plan to take your planet over and make it into a theme park. What's so bad about that? asked Richard. He liked theme parks, especially the kind with water slides. Let me describe what they have in mind, said Eric. They will turn Earth into a carnival of litter, chemical waste, and gross, disgusting rides. They will call it Toxic Waste Funland. Then they will sell tickets to their fellow dwilves and to every other screaming, thrill-seeking, pollution-loving alien in the galaxy. By this time, you and your fellow Earthlings will be in their power. They plan to put you to work as guides. When the first tour ships arrive, Earth will be trashed. And you will be a slave in a funny hat. Yikes, said Richard. It all sounded pretty bad to him, especially the part about the funny hat. Yikes is right, said Eric. On Dwilb, they call Earth the planet of pollution. And they are so sure of success that they have already started advertising. They are running commercials for toxic waste weekends on the intergalactic shopping network. But why us? asked Richard. Aren't there lots of other planets to choose from? I hate to be the one to break this to you, said Eric. But Earth is the most polluted planet in this sector of the galaxy. Richard was surprised. He knew Earth was polluted. But was it bad enough to attract aliens? They like what they see here, said Eric. The dirt, the waste, the chemicals. They think Earth will make them a fortune. Well, we can stop them, right, Eric? asked Richard. I mean, how bad can these guys be? Especially with a bogus name like Dwilbs. Who are they, anyway? How do we find them? Eric sat down on a stack of X-Men comics. According to Brigade Intelligence, they are here, in your very town. A heavy source of pollution has drawn them dash. I'll bet it's the chemical plant, said Richard. They're being investigated for dumping toxic waste. Mom's working on the case. Richard's mother was a lawyer. Her specialty was the environment. Or maybe it's the oil spill, said Richard. Last week, a tanker had leaked thousands of gallons of oil up the coast. Now the oil had reached Richard's town. There were news stories about it every day. Toxic waste and an oil spill, said Eric. For Dwilbs, that's the perfect double feature. Well, so, let's get them, said Richard. What do they look like? They look like humans, said Eric. And they say everything twice. This has a slightly hypnotic effect. The longer you spend with them, the stronger their hold over you gets. Really? said Richard. You know, I think I just met someone who says things twice. But I can't remember who. That is part of their power, said Eric. You hear them, but you don't remember. And every time you hear them, there was a knock on the door. Quick! Behind the X-Men, whispered Richard. Eric hid. Come in, called Richard. Mrs. Bickerstaff and Bob stood in the doorway. Bob's come to say goodbye to you, sweetie, said his mother. Bob gave him a big smile and a little wave. Good night, Richard, he said. Good night, Richard. Three. 
Breakfast the next morning was not a happy meal. Every time Richard thought of the way Bob had said goodnight, he practically choked on his waffle. His mother was dating an alien, and she didn't even know it. Richard, honey, you're not eating, his mother said to him from across the table. She put down the Sunday paper. I'm beginning to worry about you, and I'm already worried about you, thought Richard. Your new boyfriend probably has an antenna behind his ear. But all he said was, I'm okay, mom. Just not too hungry. Try to eat a little, said his mother. Then something in the paper caught her eye. I don't believe this, she said. The oil spill is getting bigger. And nobody seems to know why. Bad news. Eric's voice boomed into Richard's head. Richard dropped his fork. He always forgot that the alien could speak to him this way as if he were inside Richard's brain. Actually, he was inside. Richard's pocket. It is the aliens, said Eric. Pollution levels will rise sharply from now on. We must move with speed. Richard jumped up from the table. Got to go, Mom, he said. Think I'll take a ride on my bike. Be back in time for lunch, Richard, said his mother. We're having company. Okay. I hear you, muttered Richard as he raced out the door. But he wasn't talking to his mother. He was talking to Eric, who was telling him to get to the oil spill fast. Richard hunched over his racing bars and paddled hard. Ten minutes later, he was at the beach. He dropped his bike and walked down a wooden ramp onto the sand. The beach was empty. Richard was surprised. Lately, there were always people here working to clean up the spill and clut ING Henry and a bunch of kids from their class. Henry was the captain of the school's green patrol. He was really serious about the environment. Richard pulled Eric out of his pocket. Funny that nobody's here, he said. Look again, said Eric. He pointed at the water. The sky was dark and overcast and the ocean was rough. At first all Richard saw were the waves breaking and beyond that the spill a great big sludgy mass of black liquid floating on the green of the ocean. It smelled bad like rotten eggs. It had never smelled this bad before, thought Richard. And it did look a lot bigger than it had just a few days ago. Richard felt a little like choking. His eyes began to tear. He took off his glasses and wiped his eyes with his jacket sleeve. When he put his glasses back on, he finally saw what Eric was pointing at. I oh, he gasped. I don't believe it. There, swimming right in the middle of the sludge, were four no, five guys. They were wearing bathing caps and bobbing up and down in the slick as if they were on a trampoline. They were totally covered with black smelly oil. Not only that, they were slapping each other on the back and laughing. Meet the dwilbs, said Eric grimly. Ack! Gross, said Richard. He felt sick. And then they spotted him. Hi, there. Hi, there, they called. Come on in. Come on in. Richard backed away. Ari, he gasped. How do we get rid of these guys? They're really scary. Ah, uh, ah. Uh. The little alien didn't really answer. Richard looked at him in alarm. You know how to get rid of them, right? Was it his imagination, or had Eric turned a deeper shade of pink? Of course I know, said Eric. Or to be more precise, I did know. Before I had to travel in that torture chamber you earthlings call fortune cookie. The trip has done something to my memory. Oh no, 
moaned Richard. You mean you forgot? Richard's heart sank. Eric's memory was terrible. It will come to me, said Eric. In time. Join us. Join us, squawked the aliens again. It's fun. It's fun. Richard flinched. They sounded so cheerful. He wanted to leave, but it was hard to tear his eyes away from them. His feet felt as if they were planted in the sand. Richard, boomed Eric. Snap out of it. Let us go back to your dwelling. Now. Richard forced himself to turn away. Do not worry, said Eric as Richard pedaled home. Things will get better, I swear, by the great gazook. But when Richard got home, things got worse. Bob showed up for lunch. Great chili, Harriet, he said. Great chili. Then he started talking to Richard's mother about his business Bob's mighty movers. A van for this, a truck for that will get you there in no time flat, was his motto. He was thinking of using it in a radio commercial. So, what do you think? He asked Mrs. Bickerstaff. What do you think? I like it. I like it, she said. Richard's jaw dropped. Was his mother turning into an alien, like Bob? Uh, Mom, may I be excused? He asked hastily. They hardly noticed when he left. 4. On his way to school the next morning, Richard kept thinking about the dwilbs and the oil spill. Every time he did, he felt a little sick. Just as he got to the bus stop, something hit his leg. It was a piece of newspaper. Richard picked it up. What was it doing here? He looked around. Newspaper, empty paper cups, and crumpled brown paper bags were everywhere. Normally, the streets were pretty clean. Not now. Eric could read Richard's thoughts. Dwills, he said tersely. They dash, he stopped. Richard had come to a sudden halt. Then he groaned. What is it, boy? The alien climbed out of Richard's pocket. Look, Eric. Over there. They had come to the bus stop. A school bus had just pulled up and kids were climbing on. But Richard wasn't pointing at them. He was pointing to the bus's back fender. Two pale, flabby men wearing straw pork pie hats were crouching behind the bus. They were sucking on its exhaust pipe. Ack! exclaimed Richard. They're inhaling the fumes. And nobody's paying any attention to them. It was true. While the men took turns, kids just kept climbing onto the bus as if nothing was wrong. Just then the men noticed him. Try some? One of them asked with a big smile. Try some? It's really delicious, said the other one. Really delicious. Richard stood there. Could they be telling the truth? Run! Eric's voice boomed in Richard's head. Richard ran. He made it to school on time, but only because he ran the whole way. Once he was in class, though, his mind kept wandering. He kept seeing the Dwilks at the bus stop and remembering how he almost couldn't move when they talked to him. Richard wondered if he should talk to Henry. Henry knew all kinds of facts and figures about pollution he had turned into a real expert. Maybe he could come up with an idea to stop the Dwilbs. Somebody's got to, thought Richard. He decided to grab Henry the minute lunch period started. He and Henry always had lunch together, even though they didn't trade sandwiches anymore. These days, Henry was eating raw vegetables and goat cheese. Richard couldn't stand that healthy stuff. 
His idea of a good lunch was a Snickers bar and a jelly donut. Unfortunately, his mother didn't see things his way. She made him tuna on whole wheat. When the bell rang, Richard jumped to his feet. Mrs. Marks, his teacher, stood up too. Just a moment, class, she said. Before you leave, I'd like some volunteers for beach. Clean up. She looked expectantly at Henry. He always volunteered. But Henry didn't raise his hand or even look up. He just tapped his foot as if he was bored. Mrs. Marks looked around the classroom. No one moved. Green Patrol, she said. Don't you want to help? There was silence. Not really, said Henry slowly. Then he laughed. So did everyone else. Richard's mouth dropped open. What was going on? Why was Henry acting so weird? The Dwilbs are making progress. Eric sent the thought to Richard. He sounded worried. I don't understand you kids sometimes, said Mrs. Marks. She sighed. All right. Class dismissed. Richard grabbed his pack. Now it was more important than ever to talk to Henry. He hurried into the schoolyard. On warm days like today, everyone liked to eat outside. There were crowds of kids in the yard, and they were all eating something Richard had never seen before. The stuff looked like soft ice cream or frozen yogurt, only it was a really dark color, almost black. It smelled bad, too. Richard wrinkled his nose. He couldn't quite tell what the smell was, just that it reminded him of something he didn't like. Everyone was wolfing the stuff down. Richard was surprised to see that it came in styrofoam cups, the kind nobody was supposed to use anymore. And kids were throwing the cups and plastic spoons on the ground when they were finished. What is going on? Thought Richard. The Dwilts have reached your schoolmates, Eric said. His voice was tense. Do not like this. They are moving very quickly. Then Richard saw Henry. His friend was making his way through the crowd to a little food cart at the end of the yard. Richard followed him, kicking his way through piles of empty styrofoam cups. There were about 20 kids at the cart. They were all shoving each other and waving dollar bills and yelling, get out of my way. I'm next. No, I am. Above their voices came the cries of the food vendors, two pale, flabby guys wearing red plastic jughead hats. Frozen sludgies, they squawked. Frozen sludgies. Come and get em. Come and get em. The smell at the stand was strong, almost overpowering. With a shock, Richard realized it was the smell of rotten eggs, the smell of the oil slick. He started to feel nauseous. Aliens. They were showing up everywhere. And what were frozen sludgies? For a second, Richard's mind stopped. The thought that came to him that the aliens were selling a frozen dessert made from the oil slick was so disgusting that he pushed it away. Then he saw Henry buying a sludgy from one of the aliens. Don't eat it, gasped Richard. But Henry didn't hear him. As Richard watched, he began wolfing the mess down noisily with his mouth open. He was acting as if he was in some kind of speed eating contest. Sludge dribbled down his chin and onto his shirt. Henry didn't seem to notice. He was too busy eating. When he finished, he dropped his spoon and empty cup on the ground and headed back to the cart. Richard's stomach nodded up. He felt dizzy. Maybe it was the smell of the sludgies. Maybe it was the sight of his best friend acting like a total gross pig. Either way, it was too much for him. Henry, 
said Richard. Aren't you at least going to throw the cup in the trash? Richard couldn't believe he was saying this. Henry was always the one who was telling Richard to eat right and clean up after himself. Henry looked at him without saying anything. His face, usually so friendly, looked dull and suspicious. I mean, we should clean up after ourselves, right? Richard added weakly. Duh. What for? sneered Henry. Richard took a step backward. For once, he couldn't think of a single thing to say. Five. Art was the last class of the day. Usually, it was Richard's favorite. He always had a good time drawing spaceships and creatures from other galaxies. But not today. Today, he caught himself sketching a flabby guy wearing a funny hat. What am I doing? He thought. I hate the dwilbs. He threw down his pencil. Just then, the public address system came on with a loud screech. There was a violent thump against Richard's chest. What was that? boomed Eric. He was in Richard's shirt pocket. Probably Principal Felshin. Richard sent the thought to Eric. He likes to make announcements. Good afternoon, girls and boys. The principal's voice was unhurried and dull, and he always took a really long time between words. Richard thought he sounded as if he was talking in slow motion. There are dot a few important points I would like to review with you this afternoon, said the principal. The first has to do with the use of the halls as a meeting place. The halls, as you know, are passageways designed for travel from one classroom to another. They are not clubhouses and they are not living rooms. They are conduits. And I hope you will look that word up. At any rate, to get back to my original point, I would like to discourage any and all students from passing time in the hallways when they should be spending it to better effect. That is moving briskly along to their next class, asking pertinent questions of their devoted teachers, or most important of all, dot tutoring. My next point is about the copy machine. As you know, a paper clip left in the copier can do it. Serious harm. It can jam the machine, thus incapacitating it. I hope you will look that word up. This, in turn, dot can affect the workings of the entire dot coal. For what is a school without a copy machine? I will answer that. It is a ship without a sail. A car without an engine. A refrigerator without an ice cube maker. Principal Felshin droned on and on. Richard, like most of the other kids in his class, didn't pay him any attention. Principal Felshin made two or three announcements a day, and they were all incredibly long and incredibly boring. Richard sometimes thought the principal should have a radio show late at night for people with insomnia. He could put anyone to sleep. The kids all called him the Sandman. Richard felt his eyelids getting heavy. He looked around the art room. A few kids were yawning. And Felshin had been talking for only two minutes. Eric stirred in Richard's pocket again. There is something about the way this man speaks, he said. Principal Felshin's droning voice finally stopped and the PA system shut off with a loud buzz. You mean Felshin? asked Richard. What about him? He's totally boring. By the great gazook, boomed Eric. Boring? That's it. What's it? asked Richard. What do you mean? Just then the bell rang. School was over for the day. Suddenly the art room was wide awake again. Richard grabbed his pack, jumped out of his seat, and joined the crowd that was rushing out of the building. 
What's going on? He said to Eric as soon as they were off the school grounds. The suspense is killing me. He pulled Eric out of his pocket. I have just remembered something about the Dwilbs. Something crucial, declared Eric. What is it? There is a disease they catch very easily. A disease? What kind of disease? asked Richard. It is called boredomitis, said Eric. And it is fatal. I'm not sure, understand, said Richard. You mean if they get bored they get sick and die? In a nutshell, yes, said Eric. They have very short attention spans. So they get bored very easily. And as soon as they do, they get boredomitis. But they don't die right away, added Eric. The disease has four distinct stages. What are they? asked Richard. Bored silly. Bored to tears. Bored stiff. And bored to death, said Eric. Really? said Richard. He found himself grinning at the little alien. Suddenly, he felt hopeful again. It was a great feeling. Really? said Eric. He grinned back. Then all we've got to do is bore them to death, said Richard. Right? No, said Eric. We must bore them stiff. Then we can ship them back to Dwilb. Once they recover, they will tell everyone on Dwil how boring Earth is. No Dwilb will ever want to come here again. Richard imitated the Dwilbs. Too boring. Too boring, he squawked. If I may say so, said Eric, it is the perfect solution. Except for one thing, said Richard.